you to the first official plug-in event uh, coordinated by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force for Cornet. Uh, this effort is led by myself, uh, Vijay Ramcharatar, Real Estate Manager of Spotify, and Daniel Ahn, Principal of BAM Creative. Uh, today's discussion is part of a larger agenda that we look forward to executing in 2021. This includes serving in an advisory role with the other committees, continuing to bring and build awareness throughout the chapter, as well as understand and enhance our membership and industry cultural makeup. Some rules of engagement. As a reminder, please keep yourselves on mute throughout the discussion and be sure to post any questions or comments in the chat as we will have a Q&A uh, during the last 15 minutes of the event um, and we will address. This event is being recorded and will be posted on Cornet's media outlets. We have a great discussion ahead with some wonderful industry leaders. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Aisha Green. Not only is she my dearest friend and one of my absolute favorite people on the planet, um, but she's also the Director of Attorney Development and Training at Cadwallader. So take it away, Aisha. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you everyone for joining today's program on diversity, equity, inclusion in real estate from a, lender's perspective, a leader's perspective. As Cassandra said, my name is Aisha Green, and I am the Director of Attorney Development at a Wall Street firm. I had a number of years practicing law before transitioning over to learning and development, but one of the key roles of my job is to oversee our diversity, equity, and inclusion program which includes making sure that people are hired, promoted, retained, and creating a space of belonging for all attorneys at the firm. We have some wonderful panelists today who will each introduce themselves. So if we could begin with Alexis. Um, Alexis, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Alexis Dunbar. I'm the Real Estate and Workplace Services Director at Condé Nast. My job is to oversee all lease execution, administration, any real estate projects, and pretty much manage the budget of all our locations and all our corporate departments. Thank you, Sheena. Hi, I'm Sheena Goathill. Um, a lot of familiar faces, I'm sure you've already <laughs> heard my name. I'm the current chair of the New York City chapter. Um, my day job is um, at Colliers International. I'm a broker over there and I've been there for over 12 years. But today my hat for this conversation is really about Cornette and how we can discuss this topic in more detail. Thanks. Sabrina? Hello, everyone. Um, I am the Director of uh, Facilities Design and Planning at a media company, AMC Networks, and I uh, assist with all of the planning, uh, design of studio space, of office space, of any other type of space um, within uh, various sites uh, throughout the country. And um, I also just bring a breath of fresh air, you know, into the space uh, with my colleagues. And Vincent. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. My name is Vincent Mason, senior project manager with JLL. Um, for the most part, just work on projects such as a such as Condé Nast and um, City Harvest, um, mainly facilitating the design and construction as well. Um, sometimes babysitter, sometimes project manager. It just depends on the day. Thank you, everyone. So we'll be hearing a lot from our panelists a little later. Um, so for those of you who are wondering why your moderator for a panel that's focused on real estate leaders is not in real estate, um, I hope that what we'll learn at the end of today's session is that we can learn best practices from all industries, all companies, and that the responsibility of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it really lies with each individual. And we're either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. So we're here today because many of your organizations and many others have made a pledge to join together to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority. It's not an easy process to move from public statements to public action 
and to move from pass passive allyship to more overt action. But once we decide that we're all gonna get a little uncomfortable and learn, we can do this and work with one another. So we're gonna talk a lot today, but we wanna hear from you also. Cassandra mentioned the chat. I'm gonna share some questions with our panelists, but as they're answering the questions, if you have a response about what you or your organization happens to be doing, please do add it to the chat because we wanna have a strong list of best practices from all organizations, but also share questions so we can address them at the end of the program. So to dur during today's discussion, we're gonna be focused on three kind of core areas, combating workplace unconscious bias, creating belonging and taking action. So we'll get started by unpacking an unconscious or implicit bias, which is defined as a prejudice or an unsupported judgment that's in favor of or against one thing, one person, one group, as you compare it to another. And usually it's unfairly comparisons. It's something that we all do. We all have unconscious biases. It might look like a preference towards one gender over another, which often comes from some deep rooted beliefs about gender roles or stereotypes or preferences. In a workplace, it might result in hiring or promoting some people at the exclusion of others or not having a work environment that fosters a development uh, and training environment that's good for everyone. So panelists, I would like to ask each of you, what actions have your individual companies taken to understand, combat, and address unconscious bias? So Sabrina, would you like to start by talking about some of the things that your company has done? And again, in the chat, if you have anything your organizations are doing, please feel free to add. Sure, thank you. Um, well, we've uh, formed um, employee resource, resource groups several years ago. So that has definitely helped. But then last year, everyone was asked to participate in unconscious bias training. And the training classes consisted of individuals from different levels of the organization for several hours. And um, I think that it was, you know, for the most part, I think that everyone came out of there interacting with people differently, uh, being more conscious about what they say and how they do things um, within their own departments and across the organization. And I feel like we have more cohesion. We have more of that togetherness, inclusivity, and people just feel like there's just a whole revival like within the organization. And you know, it's, it's really positive. I, so I, I think that for my company, uh, we garnered a better result as a result of everyone attending those unconscious bias uh, training classes. And uh, we will do it again um, in the near future as well. Aisha might be frozen. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So maybe we move on to Vincent. What are your What are your groups doing? So um, at JLL, I know we have like the basic um, training that we've done, which is online that have been very creative lately. Uh, but one of the things that I do enjoy about about JLL and in, in terms of like the practice, especially with unconscious bias, is like although I'm not in the position to hire anyone, one of the things that we do is we allow the people that could potentially work with that individual that might be hired um, to actually interview that person and just see if that, that individual is a, a good fit for whomever they might be working with. Um, and a lot of times it's, you know, you're, I think everybody does, like I know everyone does have these unconscious biases, but at the same time, like certain people just feel more comfortable working with other individuals. And a lot of times it's just based on personality preferences um, for me, at least. And that's, and that's one of the things I just enjoy um, about our company in terms of like the un unconscious bias. I think there's always some type of training that can be done and, and everyone to kind of take a step back and look at themselves and try to figure out if that's something that they, that they do have that unconscious bias about, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's it's definitely something that can always be taken a step further, no matter how much a company does. 
Thank you. Alexis, Sabrina, anything else? I'm, I'm sorry, Sheena, anything else you would like to add? Sure. So on the, the Cornet side, um, some of our members may not know, but over the last couple of years, we went through an extensive restructuring program of our board, and it was really meant to be able to provide more opportunities for members to become volunteers, to eventually you know, join the organization as leaders in this industry. And so as part of that, we've, you know, expanded um, the opportunities to create a task force around this topic specifically, which Cassandra and VJ and Daniel are leading. Um, and we, we've started with just understanding where we're starting from. And I think, you know, things like this to understand what others and what companies are really doing to advance this conversation is really important for our organization to hear so that we can support, you know, other members that may not either be in the industry yet or are already in the industry and looking for a pathway to, to advance their careers. Um, and one other thing that I'll add is, you know, Global, Cornet Global has um, developed a certification program around diversity and inclusion and they've rolled it out. It's a six part series that um, I think it starts on the 26th. So if anybody is interested in actually taking that, uh, there are a lot of really um, specific topics and it's been well received to our, um, to our knowledge so far. So happy to provide anybody information about that if you want to reach out to myself or anyone on the task force. Um, for me, um, Conde has acknowledged that we have a problem with diversity and they've taken some steps to really fix the issue. They've hired outside consultants to do training and provide direction to go from um, theory to practical and from understanding to implementation. We've hired diversity leadership is something we've never had. We've hired a head of diversity. We've created diversity panels. And next year we're launching a new intern internship program that will priorities, pr prioritize young people from different backgrounds in schools and not just four year, year colleges, but from high schools and not doing your traditional hiring, but open up the doors to many more. You, you know, we're posting job opportunities externally rather than internal recommendations where everyone gets an opportunity to apply for these positions. So I think going forward, that will help. This all sounds amazing. I heard things varying from employee resource groups to changing of hiring practices, training initiatives, pipeline programming. Um, one of the things I saw in the chat is that um, Sarah Brown from Capital One says they're holding periodic guided discussions with teams to keep the conversations going and provide a forum for folks to speak openly. And they are fantastic. Um, and Sabrina, in the chat there was a question. You mentioned training people around unconscious bias. Can you provide specific examples of what those are? And be before Sabrina goes, I would like to encourage people who have not had unconscious bias training, who their organizations are not forming around this yet, to please go to um, Google and put in Harvard Implicit Bias Test. Harvard Implicit Bias Test. Harvard has a test set up to help people analyze what their own implicit biases might be. Because the first step is recognition of those biases to be able to work and combat it. So Sabrina, there was a comment about some of the examples that you learned in the course of your training. Well, um, to be honest with you, that's something that I, I can speak to it from my own personal experience, but I can't really discuss like responses that other colleagues uh, had within that training course. And we were encouraged not to even discuss it with individuals who were not in our training class. Um, but what I can say for myself is that to see a whole group of individuals on different levels, senior levels, uh, mid-levels, uh, entry levels in the same room, it's about 40 to 50 of us in the same room for three hours you know, answering questions and responding to the trainers who were there to help us unpack what our blind spots are because unconscious bias is really a blind spot that we all have. 
So it was really like posing questions to us to help us understand what's really rooted within ourselves subconsciously and also feel comfortable enough and vulnerable enough to admit it and engage our colleagues in a very honest discussion and how we could, after this session, become better versions of ourselves and to be more cohesive and more collaborative with people within the organization without judgment going forward. So that's what I learned. And one of the ways that you can see um, implicit bias, um, um, Brigitte, is an example is something called affinity bias. That means that I favor someone and I have an affinity towards them because they're like me. So how you might see this come up in hiring practices is when your organizations tell you, look for someone who is a cultural fit. What does that mean exactly, right? Does it mean that it is someone who um, went to a particular school? What that really means is how you're kind of feeling about someone. What often happens is when it's time to mentor someone or hire someone, the way that our brains work, we shortcut and immediately go to someone who is very much like us. That's an unconscious bias. And the goal is to look past someone who's like you and instead look at all the criteria that is similar to them. So that's an example of unconscious bias. So panelists, I would like to go to an other question for you, which is in your organizations, how have um, the companies worked to create a sense of belonging for everyone? What kind of initiatives? Some of you already mentioned some of your employee resource groups, um, but we'd like to delve a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more about those spaces that create a sense of belonging. So Vincent, would you mind going first this time? Definitely. Um, so of course, one of the, like you had already mentioned, the employee, employee research groups, we call them BRGs at JLL, but also one of the things that we have implemented was, uh, is a diversity group. Um, and it's, Mainly, it was it was actually started around a year and a half ago, um, maybe closer to two years ago, and it literally came simply from uh, a town hall that we had, um, where someone had asked, you know, what, how we're diversifying our our leadership up top, and you know they said we're working on it, and then I just asked how, um, and you know there was no real response for it, uh, but in turn, what that did was actually create this group that I actually truly enjoyed because it's from all, people from all different backgrounds. Um, and it's actually a volunteer basis group now too. We opened it up to, at first it was just a select few of us and then we opened it up to everyone within our department. And it just kind of brought like an understanding of different cultural backgrounds, different, um, the way people live and, and, and also like, you know, what we're actually looking for as a group, um, what we want, like what, what people are looking for, like, you know, you can always say diversity to upper management, but sometimes they don't, they don't really know if you, what that means to them. Um, it could mean something totally different from me than what it means to the next person. Um, so kind of getting that cohesiveness and also just understanding what everyone's true view of diversity and inclusion is uh, within a group um, that's very diverse. Uh, that's just a huge step for our group and for, for JLO to me. Alexis, would you like to talk about some of the belonging initiatives that are happening at Condé Nast? Um, when this start, it started about a year ago when we started with the training of managers. I found after it was, you felt like you had a seat at the table where your voice was heard in meetings versus just ignored or your comments didn't register. It, it, people were listening where it was mentioned um, how you feel invisible. No one looks like you across from you. You're the only one sitting there and you, you see more of a conscious effort to have more inclusions. And being in the real estate industry, it's more than just being a minority. It's being a woman where you're at the table sometimes and you are the only woman at that table, not just a black woman, but the only woman at that table. I find more and more you're finding that there are women at that table. It's just not a matter of just looking like you as far as race, but 
being a female at that table. So I think it's allowed us to really have a voice and I'm actually enjoying it, the direction we're going. Sabrina and uh, Sheen, I wonder if either of your organizations have any space around mentoring. Are you feeling mentored? Are you being mentored? Are you mentoring others? And is that part of your, um, your, your, your feeling of belonging in your organizations? Yes. Um, I see you nodding, so I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> we call them allyships, and I like that word, you know, and um, they have uh, introduced this whole program and they pair you with, like you choose two to three senior level executives you would like to be partnered with. And then, of course, like every few months, you will partner with the next one and the next one until the whole program is completed. So. I am partnered with an executive vice president who has worked in many different departments um, within our organization. And uh, she's amazing. And she thinks that I can actually teach her some things. So it's, it's a great partnership. And I think that the whole part point of the allyship is to help executive leaders, leaders understand how we see things, right? To see it from our lens and to perhaps take the blinders off and open up that shutter and say, okay, now I understand what she's talking about or what he's talking about, right? And it requires that you have a level of empathy. And, and that's something that a lot of leaders are leaning into now is to show empathy for another person's circumstances, another person's way of viewing things or feeling like they're not included Right. So I, I feel that this is going to be a successful um, program and I, I'm excited. And my first mentor ally, she's excited. And I, I just know that we're going to reap positive outcomes, you know, from this. Thank you for that. I think um, for many organizations, programs around mentoring or allyship or even even this next phase of sponsorship, which is getting the most senior management connected to some of your diversity um, employees is a really huge deal and very, very important in sort of bridging that gap in a sense of belonging and also supporting diverse uh, employees at the firm. So Sheena. Um, yeah, and just to add, um, you know, from a corner perspective, but also just, you know, from being on the brokerage side, our clients more and more are, are, are diverse members of their organizations. And so I, the other part is that I think this environment that we're in, this COVID environment has taught us that, you know, we need to continually change and have diverse ways of solving complex problems. And we need to be able to reach out to different various leaders that have different perspectives on how to do things or how to look at things. And so, um, you know, as, as far as Cornet goes, I think it's important to have a, a diverse member organization that will be able to foster those kinds of discussions on, a, you know, a networking basis or even in, in ways that we can learn from each other. So, um, you know, we, we have been actively looking at some of the stuff that we already do. We, we have a mentorship program, you know, we now have a task force and we, we have a more formalized process around how we engage leaders within different committees or even onboard new volunteers. So, um, you know, it's, it's a conversation that's ongoing, but we, we certainly want to encourage more and different members to be involved in the organization because that's the only way we can, you know, continue learning and teaching the rest of the, the industry. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next question shortly, but I want to um, respond to some of the things that are happening in the chat, but also ask you again to get involved. Diversity is not a noun, it's an action verb. So curious, respond in the chat. How many of your organizations have formal sponsorship, mentorship, or allyship programs? If you could let us know if your organizations have those types of programs, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Laura Patel shared that she just finished reading The Color of Law, which from a real estate standpoint is focusing on speaking to systematic racism through zoning and insurance. And it's a really good read for the industry. And so she put a link in the chat to that book if you're interested in learning more. If there was a question in the chat, I'm gonna wait until we get to our uh, 15 minutes of Q&A for the other question. Um, 
But I thought that Laura's um, sharing was a good segue into the next topic, which is what more can we do in an industry that is predominantly white, predominantly male, to take it to the next step for diversity and inclusion and bringing more people to the table? I think one of those spaces is education, right? Reading the books that, um, that Laura shared and others. So curious from all of you, and maybe Sheena, you can start with this one. What do you think are additional things that people can do to bridge the gap to make the industry more diverse and more inclusive? Yeah, I mean, even when we were prepping for this, I think one of the immediate things that I thought is, I think that, you know, Cornet should be a place where people can come and learn about this topic. So um, I think that it's it's incumbent on organizations like Cornet and also, you know, our, our, our other organizations in our, you know, network that um, are the places where people coming into the industry go first to to find their network and connect with other people that are within the network and find other like-minded people that, you know, they can kind of connect with. So I think that, um, you know, we, we want to sort of be a place where people can come and learn and we're trying to figure out the right ways to kind of encourage that and to offer it to our members um, and partnering with Global to, to do that. And I saw someone mentioned Ace Mentor. I mean, Ace Mentor has been a, a group that we've partnered with um, you know, over the years and, and, you know, partnered with specifically for our golf, um, our golf tournament year over year and those types of organizations. And there's plenty of others that we can start to continue to partner with to raise the exposure level of those organizations, but also learn from them. So um, I, th I think that, you know, like you said before, it's sort of on all of us to be educated, but also think about how to bring it back to wherever we are, whether it's work or, you know, organizations like Cornette. Alexis? I think one of the things we, we focus a lot of on the employees we hire and making sure that we hire more diverse people with more diverse backgrounds, but a lot of us are also in, pos in a position to hire vendors and, co and companies where we can insist that these companies show how diverse they are. And we should make sure, should hire companies that have a diverse background. It, this way, it kind of not just, it, you kind of show your employees, it's just not here. We're doing this everywhere. So it just changes everything. The other thing we need to do is accept invitations. A lot of times we're invited to speak at high schools and colleges, and we kind of decline because we're too busy. But these groups need to know we're here. And so when they're selecting college choices and careers, they know that this is an option. And unless they know, we can't change the field. I, I, believe that that is one of the most critical things. Mentorship is great. I like what Sabrina's company is doing. I wish Condé did the same thing, but that's something I can take back to them and say, this is what we need to do. You know, and just pulling ideas. And I, and I really love this about this group is that we can pull ideas from what's happening here at your companies and take two hours. And I thank you for that. Yeah, that's the point. We should be stealing ideas from each other left and right. And I'm seeing that um, there are organizations that are mentoring young people, which is amazing because the pipeline is yes. important. But also think about whether your organizations should be mentoring from within, should be thinking about the next stage of executive leadership. And what did the, was that look like? Are we pulling from all resources or is executive leadership year to year to year looking exactly the same, the same because of affinity bias, right? Not on purpose. It's just we're not noticing because of our blind spots. Vincent, you want to talk about some other ideas? Um, I, I think there's a, a couple different things. Like you could, one, I think listening is just a huge aspect into it. Like listen to what your employees are saying. Um, listen to just the office culture around your the, the culture around your office, observe that as well. And then also advocate for those that you know are doing great that may not look like you or whoever it is. Um, like I think advocation is always a huge thing in, in general and, and it doesn't matter like what that person's race or ethnicity is. 
um, or gender roles or, or anything. Like if, as long as they're being advocated for, I think that just brings a huge standpoint into your office. Like when somebody is telling uh, a higher up or whoever it is that this person is doing a great job. Sabrina? Um, I would just like to add that, you know, everyone has had the opportunity to have a seat at the table or, or most of us have with senior leadership um, about these specific topics. They appreciate the fact that I just don't focus on what someone's saying. I wanna see the action behind it and I want a timetable. It's just like I have a project I have to finish this project, this construction project within a certain time frame, and hopefully within budget. So I always, I'm always the one at the table who will say, okay, so when are we going to implement this new program? Right? So I'm not afraid to, you know, ask them, our leaders, to put a timetable on this, because it's one thing to say, this is what we're going to do. And it's something totally different to see it implemented, even if it's implemented in stages and phases within you know, certain groups, that's fine. But I think that most employees would love to see their ideas and their concerns implemented as quickly as possible, right? Because that becomes a fabric of your organization. And as we know, you know, some people see things from a different lens depending on the generation that you've come from, right? Um, our uh, younger population, millennials, they're our future leaders. So we have step up, we call it a step up program. So we're, we're mentoring these future leaders and we're molding them and we're giving them the tools and empowering them so that they can succeed, right? Because they see things from a different lens than we do, but there is so much richness in their ideas and how they can move companies forward to be more successful in every aspect of the company. So that's what we're doing, but I just implore everyone to, if you have a seat at the table, to, to don't be afraid to give executive leadership or at least ask them, like, what is the timetable that we're going to see some of these ideas and new ways of creating this inclusivity within our organization? I think that's a great point. And Vincent mentioned that earlier too, when, um, when his leadership said, you know, we care about diversity. He wanted to know the how and the why. And I think that it is critical for every organization to think about a diversity strategic plan over the course of several months or a year or two. Here are our goals, the benchmarks we want to set, the things we want to do. If we're not having training programs, we want to have annual diversity training programs. If we're not having an internal mentoring program, what does that look like and when will it be implemented? If we don't have employee resource groups, which groups are we targeting? What groups should we have and when should we organize them? So putting it on a timetable and really putting pen to paper as quickly as people wrote those public statements, they should be as quickly writing down what the next steps will be and making sure that they're staying accountable to that because if you have a plan that you've written down, it keeps you focused, it keeps you um, engaged. So I wanna go um, back to the chat for a moment if we can. Um, Tony asked a really good question, which is how have your efforts changed as COVID has kept more people working online at home? How are you and your organizations focusing on DNI at this time? Um, I'll let my pan the panelists um, think about this for a moment, but I can share something that's going on in law firms, because it may be not a surprise to you that law firms have very similar issues uh, around diversity and retention of diverse talent um, in the legal industry. And one of the things that was a big concern was if we're all home, how do you create a sense of belonging for people who feel already not in a spirit of, you know, part of the fabric of the organization. And one of the many things we do is our um, employee resource groups, we double down. We didn't pull back, right? Coffee hours and chats. We know people are Zoomed out, but we try to have speakers, professional development programs, mentoring initiatives, uh, very specific agenda-based focused targeted events for the employee resource groups to keep them connected inviting firm leadership 
to come to those meetings and speak to them after um, the chaos of summer where everyone woke up and realized what state the country was in with regard to police brutality, we invited in speakers right away to come in and talk about it and invited the managing partner of our firm to come and speak to our black attorney group about how they were feeling and what they were going through. And then we created a video highlighting attorneys and staff at our firm who are black and brown and wanted to share what it feels like day-to-day -day basis to be a black person in America. And we had a town hall and shared that video out for people. It was really enlightening because very often people think of diversity and racism as something that happens outside of their corporate doors. But to see the individuals within the firm say, I too am impacted was really enlightening. So um, for everyone else, if you could share during COVID, how are you still focusing on DNI initiatives? Sheena, I'll ask you to go first. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we, it, it hasn't really, it kind of goes right back to our, our plan around restructuring and getting people of different ideas and different, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't exactly a response. I mean, it was elevated by the current events, but I think this is something that we, we wanted to do as an organization already is to be able to, you know, have an open door to bring different viewpoints and leaders into our organization. So, you know, certainly after the, the events over the summer, you know, this became something that we really wanted to organize a task force around. And I think, um, you know, to your point, actually virtually, it, it's, it's given us all an opportunity to meet a lot of different people that, you know, even in person, I, I met some of the people that are even on this call, but I probably hadn't had a chance to really connect with them. And it's actually given an opportunity to, connect with people in a different way. So I think it, it's, it's something that we hope to do more and we, we definitely doubled down on the amount of programming that we did. I don't know that we specifically focused it on this topic, but I think, you know, at a base level, just introducing people to diff other different people um, just expanded our horizons around, you know, everything within real estate. And it eventually went into a conversation about this topic as well. So it was helpful to have, you know, a conversation on it. We, we did host a coffee chat on, on diversity and inclusion just for our members to, you know, have an open forum to talk about it. And I've had several conversations with a lot of the people within our board and even members on, you know, what Cornet can do to advance this conversation and continue it, um, you know, going forward. So I think we're still in a place where we're learning, but I don't know that anything specifically changed on where we were trying to head specific to COVID. I think it's actually made it, made it easier to implement some of these things because we're, we're able to you know, break down the walls of who you talk to and how you connect with people. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Very often we think of COVID taking us away, but with the virtual platform, sometimes you know it's easier to get people back together because, you know, we're, we're, we're home um, or we can just click on the Zoom link. And, you know, my encouragement is don't back away, lean in a bit because you actually can get more people. Um, because it was a surprise question, does anyone else from the panel want to share on this topic about COVID and keeping DNI up behind the conversation? Okay. Alrighty. So how can you keep your firm engaged when budget cuts have taken away from the opportunity to bring in speakers? Anyone from the panel want to tackle that one? Well, I, I, know I, I, can, I can share what we have done. We made the argument that we're not paying to travel. So <laughs> can we get that speaker? Or you can use Cassandra's example. She asked her best friend to help moderate. Lean into your networks, you'll never know. Um, last week we did a program on voting rights and we had um, the leadership conference on civil and human rights come in and speak at my firm. And the leadership conference is an organization that is the umbrella organization for all civil rights organizations. I reached out to my friend who's the voting rights director there 
you know, and ordinarily we might have had to pay. But I said, Lee, I need you to do this for me. And she did it. So I would say reaching out to your networks, but making the case for also why it's important. How are you all managing with budget cups, cuts and and DNI? Can anyone share? Well, um, you know, we're a media company, so we lean into our talent of our shows. And um, we've had like talks, we call them talks, within the company, of course, with a few hundred employees attending for an hour with the actor and one of our senior executive leaders, you know, uh, having, you know, a fireside kind of chat with them. And um, so now we do it through Zoom. So it's amazing. You know, we, we haven't discontinued the talks. We still, you know, uh, ask our talent um, to uh, join uh, these talks via Zoom. And then we open it up to Q&A. And, um, you know, it's just, um, it just leaves everybody with such a great feeling like we never left the office, but we're just on a screen. And also our executive leaders, I mean, they're really doing a great job. I, I just can't emphasize this enough with ensuring that they join in ERG's meeting. So when we were in the office, of course, they're so busy, they can't come into a conference room with 30, 40 people all the time. But now they're joining in the Microsoft Teams into our ERG meetings, which is just amazing, you know? So that's something that's different. And, I, and of course, it's going to continue to be that way going forward. So it's a win-win for us, you know, being away from the office. Sabrina, I may call you up to dig into your talent, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> We're going to all work together. Anyone else from the panel want to um, address that question? I, I do think the biggest thing that we've, we've done is just address the, we try to address the elephants in the room, and in particular, like in our diversity groups. Um, and then also having our managing director actually in those meetings really means a lot. Like it makes you, it, it makes it, it's very genuine when that person um, of leadership is actually in your meeting with you and willing to take on questions head on and also understand situations that may not truly always affect that person like directly, but they can understand and sympathize now after having a conversation, how it does affect them and, and how it affects us. Um, those are, that's just for us. And, and of course the BRGs are, are also a great way, even though you like, it's Zoom, it's not necessarily as connected um, but it just provides a, a place of belonging at the same time. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, Vincent, with having the, the leadership, to have the head of your company get on a Zoom meeting and says, yes, we have a problem, and this is what I'm going to do to fix it. And people have time. You're sitting home, you're working, you have time. So more people are paying attention, more people are attending the Zoom meeting, and I, f and I find at Conde now, they've really broadened the conversations. It's just not on one topic. It is going from, from the higher end to how to wear your hair, just various topics that were, were often not addressed or talked about, or it's a, it is, I think COVID's made it better as far as communication even though you're not reaching out and touching, but you are actually having a conversation and you're heard. You know, people are listening and you have other groups forming from that group who talk about other things. So it's really interesting. Thank you all. Heading back to the chat, um, Tony says, I think uh, DNI strategic plan is great. If that plan links to your organization's business plan and shows quantitatively where possible how it links to the organization's goals, you may improve the likelihood of success. I could not agree more, especially when you're talking about diversity and its impact on the business um, line, right? That's incredibly important, right? Um, there have been, there's been tons of research that shows that diversity has positive impact on business and on the financial wealth of a business and the financial performance. Um, the Center for Talent and Innovation has done research on this time and time again. So if you can show statistically why diverse people leaving has a business impact, the amount of money spent on recruiting has a business impact, you can really get people to sit down and listen. So I think that a strategic plan 
should absolutely align with the organization's plan. And we have a question here from Yvonne. Yvonne asked, I've heard several people mention that their diversity programs, um, training, et cetera, has started over a year ago. Have you seen any change? Uh, or are you seeing more change now that diversity is all over the news? Who would like to tackle this one first? Panelists. Uh, I'll tackle that um, one. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> a year ago, did I see any change? No. Since um, the summer, now you're seeing some changes in their hiring practice and their goals. You're getting a lot more communication from the leadership, of what they're doing, pay equity, a lot of, of various things that were talked about, but no action taken. Now you're seeing action taken because it's in the news, it's everywhere. You can't miss it. So I, I think between that a year ago, maybe they were working all these things and it just took its time. But I think after the summer, it really pushed, it just pushed it further along. They kind of doubled down on efforts to change the conversation. Absolutely, I think that's right. If you're looking at the news right now and you've seen JP Morgan, Starbucks, have all said, we're going to withhold compensation from our executives who are not on board and pushing the agenda for diversity. It goes to show you where people are moving in the spectrum. Everyone, no matter what point they were, they're pushing it a little bit further. Vincent? Um, the one thing I've noticed is that we are all um, able to pay attention to it now. So every, and I think COVID is, that's also kind of going back to the previous question, but COVID has, has also brought in light to the fact that you now see that there are things that happen outside of the workplace that are gonna affect your employees and in the workplace. Um, so like, now that it's there, you're expecting, and I feel like employers should be put on notice that we do expect somebody to say something about this and not the standard, um, your standard, uh, you know, HR response. It needs to be something that's definitely genuine. And also it's not genuine unless you talk to the employees. So to piggyback on that, um, someone asked, how are your firms expanding DNI during COVID for remote work? Parents have specific struggles, large households might lack equipment and broadband, there are staff with health conditions who fear returning early, but don't want to be left out. Um, how do you spotlight um, these groups? Um, I will share that at Ked Wilder, we coincidentally in January started a parents affinity network. And thank goodness we did, because by March, it was desperately needed. Um, and we probably would have created one after March with everything that had happened, but the parent struggle issue is a real one. And it is a diversity issue. Um, so if people have business resource groups and do not have parent groups, I would encourage you to think about whether to expand to that because it's been very helpful. We've had people come in and talk about um, managing school, managing stress. Um, we're working on a pro program for helping out with mental health and kids at the firm, read to one of the younger kids. So how are you all um, dealing with these same issues at your organizations? Panelists, anyone wanna share? Um, what we would normally do prior to the children returning to school is have the Project Backpack Initiative where we have employees buy all of these school supplies and back, brand new backpacks, lunch boxes. So since, of course, we are not in the office to all get together and assemble all of these items, uh, we chose a few organizations that all of our employees could make their donations to so that all of the children that we have serviced in these underserved communities throughout the years can still receive the school supplies, the backpacks, the lunch boxes. Um, and then also we do a food pantry drive as well. So we do the food, we do the backpacks, and then we do the food. So now, of course, there's an outpouring of support because there are so many people who have to rely on food pantries to feed their families. 
So even though we're not in the office, like we are sending out reminders, you know, I know some people are probably annoyed with all the reminders that we have sent, but we just want to make sure that we're still doing our part, even though we're not in the office, because that's really important to us is to always give back and to pay it forward and to make sure that those initiatives don't fall by the wayside. And then of course, the last uh, initiative would be the coat drive. Uh, that's coming up towards the latter part of November and December. So that'll be the third one. Anyone else want to share? I'll just add a comment. I think that, um, you know, to, to what um, was shared on the chat from Gerald, I think just from my own sort of um, perspective. I think that this environment where we are all sort of forced to be virtual for some, you know, part of our day, whether we're allowed to go in sometimes or not, but our, our primary sort of form of communication is virtually, it's broken down a lot. I mean, I think even for myself, I think, you know, I had a, a work personality and then there was another side of me that you may not have totally shared or been open to sharing because you didn't know you, you thought you may be different or you wouldn't be accepted or your views were different or whatever it might be. It's just, it's just different between work and your personal life. Um, and I think that this has just broken all of that down. I, I'd say between when the pandemic started and now, just being able to openly share, you know, anything that's happening in your day or it's forced because, you know, your kids are running into the Zoom call or whatever it is. You know, I think it, it has sort of broken down that barrier of actually realizing that we're all just people. So we need to understand what people are, are dealing with and what is important to them and what's going to block them from being their best form of themselves at work. Um, if you're thinking as an employer, and I think that this is a really big opportunity for companies. I read a really crazy stat the other day. I shared it with some of the women in Cornette, but it, it, in the elevator, the, the captivate message was like one in four women is looking to downshift or leave the workforce. And that stat, I don't know, just like really, it really like made me upset. I mean, as much as we want to continue to expand what this conversation is all about for any person that has a diverse viewpoint on anything, we all have to just be cognizant of the fact that we're all people and we all have other things in our life. And if companies start to appreciate that and, and provide more flexibility and they're more open to listening, as Vincent said, um, I think it's really important. So just a personal comment. <laughs> yeah, so VJ, who's gonna close us out in a moment, mentioned in the chat that um, there's a lot of energy around this. So we should be striking while it's hot. So for those of you who are on call today and thinking about striking while it's hot, you've heard a lot of things mentioned. Just curious, are there any ideas, initiatives, programs that you heard today that you think you may wanna implement at your organizations or share with your leadership? Please share it in the chat. Um, whether it was employee resource groups or mentoring or allyship or sponsorship programs or pipeline programs, whether it was a strategic plan, if there's something you learned today that you think you wanna implement or bring back to your organizations to have an impact, please do share it out in the chat as we have VJ close us out. But thank you so much to your panelists. They were wonderful. I'm gonna add my little reaction to show how much I appreciated them. Um, BJ? Thank you, Aisha. You're a super excellent moderator. Um, uh, I personally learned uh, quite a bit here. And uh, thank you to the panelists, um, Alexis, Sabrina, uh, Vincent, and, and Sheena. Um, and thank you, Sheena, for making this uh, diversity and uh, inclusion initiative possible in the New York chapter of Cornette. Um, I wanted to close out the conversation with a, with a quick thought. Um, Mahatma Gandhi is once quoted as saying, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and test of our civilization. And if you were to extrapolate that to our industry or even the, the company that you work for, um, uh, diversity in perspective in people, um, in thought process, even in political leanings, 
you know, uh, as Sheena said, we're all people, um, and the the key to any uh, collective success is to um, appreciate and and validate and leverage those different perspectives. And uh, um, you know, mentorship, leadership, holding your leaders accountable, those are all great ways to do it. And uh, I, I think. Um, whether for Cornet going forward, obviously, you know, Cornet's a great resource as is for real estate professionals. Um, and I think we can elevate that by um, taking some uh, of these thoughts and initiatives provided today in this, this, uh, this conversation and leveraging uh, those ideas to, to help uh, diversify our, our membership and, and uh, spread information and, and, and leverage our, our different um, initiatives like the mentorship program and university outreach, et cetera, to uh, broaden the um, the, uh, prof the prof professional base of, of commercial real estate as is, and get it from being the uh, what used to be. Um, and it's 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 getting there as is, but uh, not as quickly as we can hope, right? Get it, getting it from being. Uh, uh, an older uh, uh, upper class uh, white gentleman conversation to being like Alexis said, uh, a diverse um, uh, set of people at the table. I, I notice it uh, more and more myself that now uh, when I go to do a deal as a real estate professional, um, there's someone that might look like me or someone that uh, I could relate to on the other side of the table. And that's the, the the part of being human is is being able to connect um uh based on shared experiences and perspectives so uh i hope you guys uh took a lot out of this and i certainly did and and once again thank you aisha and to uh our uh, panelist group um uh thanks laura for for helping us uh laura patel for helping us get this uh you know out there and and uh, on the calendar uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone's thoughts in the group chat as well. And we'll we'll be uh, publishing um, or at least doing an email blast of everything covered in this conversation, as well as some uh, some notes from the the uh, group chat as well. Thank you guys. One fifty nine. Everyone have a great day. Ready. Thank you. Thank you.